The Diesel Podcast. Developing innovation in English as a second or other language. Episode 78, interview with Jose Goulet. Welcome to Diesel. This is episode 78. We are your hosts. I'm Brent Warner. And I'm Michelle Reyes. Hey, Brent. Hi. How are you? I'm recovered from <laughs> being really sick with COVID. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a slow crawl out, but uh, glad you're doing better overall. And I'm doing better too. Oh, yeah. You were sick too. Yeah. We, we all got sick. That's that's winter, you know. Um so we, I, I think that the voice is better than the last episode, though, for both of us. Oh, my gosh. We we're, were just both at the croaking very, frogs. very tail end of it now. And now <laughs> we're mostly okay. So Yeah, that's right. My voice was matching your pitch last time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> what not to love about COVID, right? <laughs> it is a ton that's of fun. Right. So, um, so that voice you're hearing. <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Michelle, why don't you go ahead and introduce our guest? Yes. Okay. We have, we are starting off 2023 with um, an interview with one of my colleagues, Jose Goulet. Hey, Jose, you heard him in the background? Yes. Uh, let me uh, give him the formal introduction. Um, he, as I said, he's one of my colleagues and he's doing great things in the classroom. And when I heard about it, I thought, oh, my goodness, I need to I need to go observe this this teacher. Um, Jose started teaching at the age of 19 in Brazil. He's taught in Vietnam and in various institutions in the U.S. His academic background includes English, literature, linguistics and legal studies. <laughs> He describes himself as a teacher who loves learning from, about, and with students. He is a teacher's fan. He enjoys collaborating with his coworkers and learning from them. He has an inquisitive mind and derives joy when he finds solutions for classroom issues that may seem trivial to many, but can become a major struggle for students. Teaching is his passion, not his profession. He is a citizen of the planet. And without further ado, Jose. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you, guys. <laughs> thank you for the introduction. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. No, it's my pleasure to be here and share. Yeah, so Jose, one of the, uh, the, the popular stories that I hear from people who have been able to observe your classroom um, is was about using remote control cars in a classroom. And so that yeah. is what... Um, led me to 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 having you on the show and part of it is because you turned a lesson that could just be a boring paper lesson into something that was physical and um that helped the students internalize even though i'm I'm assuming it, it maybe didn't go perfect the first time but it was effective yes um that lesson is actually um what the first time I used remote controlled cars in the classroom was uh, an eye opener to me. I thought about how one simple tool could roll out into different things and make my life as a teacher easier and make the students experience more enriching and fun, you know. He can you tell us a little bit more about the lesson and the concept? Because people are thinking, how am I going to use remote controlled cars in the classroom? Uh, sure. And I'll give you a few scenarios on how you can apply that tool as well. Um, and those are things that I actually do in my class, in my classes, in different levels. And uh, don't be intimidated thinking my students are business people. They'll not get into it, you know, the People are competitive. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yes. So, uh, one, uh, when I used the remote controlled cars in my class the first time was simply to teach directions. I cut out a map. I placed a map of a city on the floor, on the classroom floor. I asked the students to make space, <clears throat> moving the desks out of the way, you know, and I had two group of students. One of the students would drive the car from point A to point B, while the other student was supposed to give directions. 
But the caveat is the student who was driving the car did not know where they were going. So they couldn't cheat mm. on the map <laughs> and drive themselves to that point. So I just wrote in a piece of paper where the GPS, quote unquote, should take the student who was driving the car. And um, they loved it. And, you know, the carts are not responsive. So they bump into things. They <laughs> they drive <laughs> backwards. So <laughs> it makes it for, for a fun uh, moment with the students as well. Um, that was that is the the easiest most traditional way to use remote controlled cards in the classroom uh, option two would be instead of going through activities that are multiple choice activities where the students have to pick alpha bravo charlie delta a b c d one two three four you can simply just write those options in post-it notes spread them around the classroom, uh, split the students into two teams, and they have to drive to the correct answer. The group who gets to it first scores a point. People are competitive, and they love it, you know. Tell me a little uh, bit, Jose, about these cars themselves. Are they, like, are you buying, like, good remote control cars are they kind of the cheapo kid ones or what, what's... Um, the cheapo the cheapo kid ones that you can find on amazon for 20 25 bucks mm -hmm. or two or ebay you know and um as i said i'm i'm in favor of having one thing that you can use in multiple activities so that your classroom is also not cluttered you know if you have students <laughs> <laughs> if you have students who have um, problems paying attention to things and get easily distracted you know that will clear out uh, their visual space as well yes yeah, so those are cheapo carts um after i use them it's simply a, a, a group effort the students have the responsibility of cleaning them making sure everything is in place putting them back into place, it's their materials to use. It's part of their set of materials to use. So they feel engaged in the process of learning, not only from a student standpoint, sitting on a desk, but also hands-on. Like I'm responsible for these uh, materials that I'm using, so I have to take care of them. I like or, else, or else we won't have them to use in a future activity. Yeah. So that's great. Um, I, the, you know, there, there's lots of different ways. I, I love that. That's kind yeah. of like the, the <laughs> Japanese school approach, right? It's like the kids have to go clean up all their own stuff and then they have mm -hmm. the responsibility for what they're, what they're holding there. Um, I'm, uh, wondering, I think you have smaller classroom sizes. Is that right? Um, that's right. Uh, generally, the institution where I teach will not have more than 10 students per class, but I would say 7 to 10 students. Uh, however, I've used the same activity with larger groups. Okay. Uh, I just had to adapt the activity and uh, make sure everyone had a job. So yeah, so let's talk, let's talk a little bit about that because that's the first thing going on in my head is like, what are the students who are not driving or giving directions? You know, like you, I, I kind of feel like this sense of driver and navigator, right? But then you might mm -hmm. have two or three other people in a group that are watching. So mm -hmm. what are what are the roles and what are, what are the ways that you're engaging mm -hmm. the rest of the students? So the rest of the students who are not driving are supposed to help with GPS support. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I'm, a, I'm a big advocate of self-correction, so I will not interrupt students while they are performing a task unless it's way off track, mm. you know? So while the GPS is giving directions, if it's not going as it should, it's the other student's responsibility to reroute the GPS and make sure this, the, the driver is actually getting 
where they're supposed to go, that the language they're producing is accurate, mm. you know. And that leads me to another device that I use in class for those moments when I want to correct my students, but I want them to first try to self-correct, you know. So uh, those students in the background, let's quote unquote, call them my self-correction devices. You know, uh, instead of saying jump, uh, turn right, a student said jump right, I expect those students to support the GPS student and have them correct the language sample they used. Interesting. If they don't, <laughs> then I just kick them out of the classroom. Just kidding. <laughs> no. If they don't, then I come. I came up with another game, another way to gamify correction, which uh, Ishao and I have talked about, which is uh, using you know cards. But you can use literally any play cards that you have, or if you're not in favor of using cards in class, you can make your own colored system with cards or colored paper, and that will equally work. Okay, so what, what do the cards do? Okay, so uh, if you are familiar with UNO you know, cards, uh, they are uh, split in different colors, uh, green, red, blue, yellow, and the plus cards, mm -hmm. right? So I take the plus cards out of the deck, and I'll use uh, mostly green, yellow, uh, and red. I generally don't use the blue cards. So uh, while the students are talking or producing language, if I notice they made a mistake, I'll give them a red card. Oh. And I'll not <laughs> say I'll not say why. You know, I want them to stop and think about the language sample they just produced and self-correct. And self-assess self-evaluate, etc. cetera. Um, if they can't, uh, or if they, if their classmates cannot help, and I never, I never interject, I'll let them go until um, I'm happy with what they're doing. So if the, if the class as a collaborational group can't get to a correct language sample or an acceptable language sample, then I'll help them. And then I may review a grammar point or uh, show them a different way of saying what they're saying. Uh, if that student who made the quote unquote mistake uh, is able to self-correct, I give them a green card, mm. you know, and the objective is for them to accumulate as many green cards as they can during class. And then at the end of the day, they can exchange the student with the most green cards can exchange that set for a prize <laughs> okay, and it okay. doesn't and it doesn't need to be anything fancy sometimes it's a pencil or a gold coin made of chocolate or something simple you know uh while the yellow card is when the student produces a language sample that is understandable but could be more polished for their level so if we are teaching a an intermediate a higher intermediate or an advanced group you expect a certain level of language and uh, if it's not there or they're not incorporating the vocabulary that they're expected to or using a language function they're expected to then you can give them a yellow card to leave them in limbo just to show them okay it's good but it could be one million times better. Let's work on it, mm. you know? <laughs> so I think what I, what I like about that concept is that it's, <clears throat> I guess some teachers like to do the leaderboards and have leaderboards on the on the board or somewhere visible. But mm -hmm. in this case, you could also, you know, students um, have the points physically mm -hmm. with them and you wait until the end of the day. Also, some teachers don't like to post leaderboards um, simply because it might, it might, leave the one student with no points um mm -hmm. feeling <laughs> bad but i think this is a, a more subtle way of of um having those points 
Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that's a that's a very good point. Uh, one way that I found that won't let students feel left out is to have them uh, share responsibility for the learning process. So that student who is struggling could ask somebody else in class for help. Somebody else, let's say, who doesn't have a green card on them. And both of them could get a green card instantly because they collaborated to produce accurate language. Mm. You know, it's not, it's not, it's never black and white. And sometimes I'll just make the rules as I go. <laughs> yeah. And the students will question that and <laughs> they say, Mr. Gillette, uh, but and it's like, yeah, it's butter, butter. Now it's butter. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so yeah. I love this. So, so you have a, a, a deck of Uno cards. And I, mm-hmm. the, part, the other part I like about this too, and Michelle, kind of what you're getting to is like that leaderboard's very public, but you could also pretty discreetly just slide a red card to someone as you're walking by, um, mm-hmm. maybe give them a minute to think about it, to work work on it, and then come back quietly to them while, the, while other group members, you're kind of, you can circle and scan the whole classroom without calling people out, but still helping them. And maybe if they're in groups, if they get a red card, mm-hmm. like maybe their group members can help each other to fi- figure out, well, what did you say? How was it wrong? What, what would we change? How do we say it better the next time? Right. And so it could continually be something for all of them to build upon and not just not, not necessarily just the one person. So I like how it's not too, <clears throat> not too in your face, I guess. Right. Like not, no. too, not aggressive. Uh, and we have to be very culturally sensitive with uh, the types of students that we have in our class. While some of them will enjoy a more frontal correction, some of them will feel highly intimidated and never ever ask a question in class again or participate in anything again. Um, when I have more advanced classes, I leave it all to them. I will not give them cards. I give each student a set of cards and they can uh, uh, administer the the dynamics of this activity as they wish. You know, they can come up with the rules. Oh, nice. They can take rules now, which is also a part of producing a language that is authentic. I'm not there telling them, hey, you got to use the word card instead of piece of paper. You know, they will figure it out and my job is just to help them navigate um, not to dictate Um, as for the leaderboard I like the idea of having uh, the class leader some for a class period and that brings me to something else that I adapted to my classes uh, which was using the random name pickers online you know, as uh, the leader of the class for that period or the leader of the day. So there is no pressure on electing a leader. Anyone can be a leader at any point. I'm getting, um, as you're talking through these things, I'm getting um, ideas for my own classes where, oh, well, um, in, in our institution, we have the students all day long but it's divided into periods and we could then tally, okay, in the morning, the morning periods, um, which group got the highest score. Okay. That group's going to, um, be in charge of reading instructions or leading something in the class or correcting the homework for us or something like that, which, which also helps to put the, put, uh, take the spotlight off the teacher constantly Mm -hmm. delegating, um, which is a big, in in our institution, it's a big deal, right? The students have to be leading most of it. Um, And that's where I found the sweet spot from having a class that is, instead of being student-centered, to be Mm. student-led. Because there is no way you can play a game if you're not engaged. You know, you, you can't sit back and just watch the parade. You have to participate. Or else you... Uh, particularly our students, they'll put you on the spot. Like, why aren't you doing this? You know, because then if you don't do it, I, I'll have to take charge and do it. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and um, and uh, 
when we think about using technology for those, uh, you know, leader picking moments, if you don't have a computer in class or the internet is down or whatever the case is, you can simply write it in a piece of paper and give it to them and let them pick the piece of paper from a plastic bag or whatnot. Because again, it's not you doing it. And, you know, I think it's important to to remember that because I've, as teachers, we're constantly in a hurry to get through whatever we're supposed to get through. And in the we think in the in the interest of time, it's faster if I'm the one picking because I know that mm-hmm. that student's going to give me the answers or be more responsible. But there is a lot of value in allowing the students, um, giving that students that um, autonomy. And I, I, it's something that I'm constantly trying to balance because I'll catch myself, oh, I'm very big on autonomy, but here I am doing this for them. Mm-hmm. And I have to step back and let whatever messy part of that is going to happen, just happen. <laughs> We can, uh, I learned with time that we can also gamify autonomy and gamify um, timing, which I love. I'm a very musical person and I have music playing in my classroom all day on the background. uh, And I ask students first, are you okay with Starbucks music playing in the background? (laughs) And if they say yes, we'll go for it. Uh, but, um, in terms of timing, I use musical timers with the students instead of just saying you have two minutes, one minute, hurry, hurry, hurry. It's, I, I, I'll just project a YouTube video, uh, a musical video or lyric video or just instrumental music or just play something off my phone as long as it's not gangster rap. (laughs) <laughs> and um, let them use that as the timer, you know. Um, so just when the uh, song ends is when the activity ends or whatever it is like that. Yeah, exactly. Like you have, I'll tell them two minutes and then I'll play a song for two minutes and they'll know when it's up, you know. And um, Or I'll play a song and just project the timer on the screen so that they have a visual cue for it. And a, a visual cue of it uh, as they're doing their their activities. You know that re- that reminds me of a fifth grade classroom. I when I was doing my teaching credential, I had to do the you know the teacher observations, and there was a teacher who used music. And when the students, and of course these were elementary school students, so a lot of it they they were very diff- they had a hard time with keeping on track. Um, and so as soon as they walked in, she would play something from Star Wars and I can't remember which song it was, but at the end, the students knew that they had to be in their seats with their materials, with the book open to whatever page was on the board. And she never had Mm -hmm. to remind them of anything. She would just turn it on. And while the students were getting ready, she was doing attendance, uh, making sure that, um, if there were any notes for the students that they were printed out, et cetera. So that gave her that those three minutes or so. And then it gave the students like their individual time to walk around and say, how do they neighbor or whatever they're going to do when they're walking into class. And I always wanted to try that. I just never have found the song that I can play every morning. (laughs) There are a lot of these, a lot of these things like people use, use songs and use music in interesting ways. Um, I know, uh, uh, one of the one of my friends and listeners of the show, uh, Ed Campos Jr. He's he's done some cool <laughs> things around. Um, uh, he he's done some cool things with music, but like working working on the walls or working on tables or something like that. And I can't remember the details. It was it's been a couple of years since I heard this, but but he was he was using that song. I think it's a Beyonce song. The to the left, to the left, you know, to the <laughs> left, to the left. And so then oh. every time that part of the lyrics would come up, then the students were, had to move left to the next activity. So they like, they would all be working on something and then to the left, to the left comes up and then they all have to move to the next station over to the left to do, do the next part of the activity. So there's these cool mm-hmm. ways. And then it's not, totally distracting because they know the song's going on when it finishes they know the song's finished but it's not the same thing as like if a timer finishes and students aren't really paying attention and they're so engaged it's like when the music becomes part of it and then when the music Mm -hmm. stops i can see that combination that's that's pretty cool 
Huh. I never thought about that. Now I'm thinking, who I could do something with that. <laughs> Me neither. That's a good. Uh, there is that other song that says to the right, to the right, to the right, to the right, to the left, and now kick. So uh, <laughs> I just wrote it down. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, um, uh, and again, some students will enjoy that because they don't always get to it. Uh, it'll, it's almost like it turns the activity into a whole group experience. Mm-hmm. I find that with music. Um, I mean, a, a student could be working individually on something or with a group. But when you have a song, you pretty soon start seeing the students bob their heads up and down or hum to the song or some the ones that know the song will start singing. And if a couple starts singing, then the whole class starts quote unquote (laughs) singing and so it becomes this um group experience which i find i still sometimes like i'm just gonna play and see what happens (laughs) i do that every once in a while um as as far as the group experience goes um since uh my students are in class for six hours a day i don't want them to feel like they're islands on their desks Mm. i i want them to get up and move and why why do i want them to sit down and answer a b c or d when i can just tape a piece of paper on the wall and ask them as a group to write their answers you know just to keep them moving and not falling asleep Mm -hmm. and uh, as for music activities i love music so i incorporate music in my classes And it's not something that requires prep. You know, if you listen to a song and you see, let's say, a word or two in the vocabulary that you're going to teach that day, guess what? That song will become an activity. Mm. Uh, One way that I, that I do this is I play it. I always play this game with my students. It's called, I named it the last word. So uh, if I'm teaching a vocab, a set of vocab words and there's like four or five songs four or five words from that vocab in a song that i've just listened to i'll play the song and pause exactly where the word is and the students have to tell me well and then back to the uno cards i can use the uno cards as a pointing system to i'll give them points for getting what the word is Oh, so if they get it right, then you give them, that would be like another green Uno card or something like that? Mm-hmm. Correct. It's like, um, I used to have a teacher who gave, she called them chance cards. And there were yellow cards. And all throughout the day, she'd give them out for different things. It could be something like being kind to somebody, answering during class, raising your hand. And at the end of the day or at the end of the week, you could exchange it for a homework pass or little prizes. Um, mm-hmm. And they worked those worked. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I have magnetic tokens in my class. They're like the whiteboard magnet, magnetic thing that you can put papers up or mm-hmm. posters or whatnot. A colored magnet. I, mm-hmm. Yes, I use those as tokens because not always the magnets will attract, you know. So when they do something that is nice, I'll give them one and then maybe the next one they get will repel the one I gave them. So they, they got to donate that one to another student. So a oh, student who doesn't that. have one, maybe he'll well, feel very not. happy that he's getting a <laughs> gift. That's, that's, that's kind of cool. That's another uh, way of randomizing what you're getting, I suppose. And then at the end of the day, they can exchange it for something else. Um, uh, you can also use push pins for that idea because they're colorful if you have if you want to work with them as groups you know let's say the green group yellow blue and then you have a board that allows you to put push pins on them the push pin can be a pointing system and you can do a car race with them or an airplane uh uh, uh an airplane how do you say that the not the catwalk, the or the, the, run, run, the, the runway? runway, the runway. Yes. <laughs> it could be a catwalk. <laughs> yes, it can be a catwalk if you have cats walking. Yeah, the <laughs> runway. You can use different things like for for them to have that pointing system. Not only you know cards. 
literally anything goes, even erasers yeah. or or a gift bucket. You know, um, each student will have a cup on their desks, and you put stuff there. They can only take it home on Friday, and it it doesn't need to be expensive. Mm. Like an eraser, a pencil, anything, anything goes. Or with my more advanced groups, inspirational quotes. I'll, yes. I'll give them pieces of paper with inspirational quotes and just put it in their cup, and they can only read them on Friday. Yeah, I like that. That's cool. <laughs> That's good. I like that too. I can. I know that with my students, they love um, idioms. Mm-hmm. So that's a good way to. Um, incentivize the idioms. Sometimes uh, they they're afraid of them. They're afraid of idioms. But if you like, you get to draw today's idiom. Which one is it going to be? Mm-hmm. It might be one that we covered, or it might be a new one. Oh, I like all these. This is cool. these these cool little like incentive incentivizing ways to get things done that maybe don't take a lot of time or prep or effort is really great. Um, it makes me think one of my colleagues. Um, uh, Melanie Hyrie, who works who works with us um, at my school, she does um, like uh, circus tickets, you know, like the the little um, the, uh, like the raffle tickets, raffle tickets, yeah, raffle tickets, you know. So she'll they you know they're little t- tags. She just gets a big roll of them. So she like I've seen her at the beginning of the semester, and she's like, "Here's my new roll," and like she's got a huge <laughs> roll with like you know five hundred tickets or something on it, and then oh, and then she's giving those out, and then she just pulls random ones. So like as, as students are doing good work or whatever else it is, and then at the end of the day, she she pulls her matching one. So she's like number you know seventy two or whatever it is, and then whoever has that that ticket also has a chance to to win. You know, same type of thing that you're talking about, Jose, with the like. Mm-hmm. You know, it could just be like a little eraser or something simple, yeah, you, know, you know, but those, those tickets, you can buy them. They're pretty inexpensive at the dollar store. Mm-hmm. And I wow. think that now, I'm thinking now, um, so we're talking about, I know that we have plenty of apps that do this kind of random pickers or point assigning, but uh, many, many of our listeners and, and many of us will go to settings where we don't have technology available and teachers are not full time. So they don't have necessarily the the budget to spend on these um, items. And I'm thinking right now, never underestimate the power of stickers with adult <laughs> learners mm-hmm. because um, I was recently in Japan and I, want, I, I didn't want to take a lot of equipment with me. So what I did is I ordered um, United States stickers. And so I had a sticker for every state of the whole United States with their different flag, like flags and birds and whatever identified or is associated to the state. And, and I remember the first time I gave these adult, I was teaching teachers. So these adult teach uh, again, teachers of English, Japanese teachers who came back and they said, can I, can I get another sticker? <laughs> <laughs> And, and sure enough. And so this time I'll be traveling soon and I'm thinking I'm going to take this time around, I'm going to take, um, United States memorabilia stickers because you can Mm -hmm. now purchase these in in like $7. You can get a hundred or 150 stickers on Amazon. And, and right now it's, you know, it's all the rage to put them on your water bottles or, Mm. and so again, and, uh, or your computers or your luggage. And that's what I tell them. See, when you travel, put it on your luggage and they'll want them. They'll ask for them. So awesome. I'm going to experiment with different uh, genres of stickers. Um, and that reminds me, you mentioned the quote cards. And um, I don't know, Brent, if I told you this, but when I, I was recently supervising and I would have to talk to the students that were in academic trouble. So, of course, they come to me and and they're, you know, they're they're crestfallen because they didn't pass. And one of the one of the things that I would always, I'd never wanted them to think they were in trouble by seeing me. So I'd always have stickers with encouraging phrases on them. Mm. And I would always ask them to pick one. And I had one student who came one time just to see me because he had, he didn't pass the test. He was really close. And that was his way out of, out of, to the next assignment. And um, he said, teacher, teacher, I need hope. (laughs) And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. (laughs) So I looked in my little, in my little, um, container of stickers and sure enough there was a sticker that said hope (laughs) i gave it to him he kept it and again it made for a pleasant um conversation about um you know the courage to continue especially when you're 
repeatedly trying your best, but you're not, you don't feel like you're achieving in English. So um, that's just, anyway, I think now I went off track. <laughs> oh, no. that, that reminded me of something else on the class, the group card. So when a student fails a test or something, I'll have the class write that student an incentive card. Oh, wow. Okay. Tell oh. me about that. Yeah, the, just fold a piece of paper in the middle, send it around and ask them to write something nice to that student to hold on to, you know, and they they really enjoy it. I love you know, that. that's, so, yeah, I love that. I'm, I'm now thinking, um, I have had students in the past who come and tell me, teacher, remember you told me this and now I'm moving on. And I've had students who graduated from university and they still remember um and they'll remember and I'll think, oh, my gosh, of all the things, <laughs> of they all the will, things, that's yeah. what you remember. And again, we have to, I think, incorporating um, encouragement and um, self-esteem when it comes to how tough it is to to succeed in, in Eng- at another language. Mm-hmm. Um, we often forget with the pressure of everything we have to teach and the students are supposed to show that they can do. Um, it's just so important to include that in and infuse it into everything we do i agree with you and i always think um from this perspective you're going to be in that school for i don't know six eight hours a day if you're not having fun and enjoying it as worse as bad as it can be you you are wasting your time and life Mm -hmm. so yeah so uh, let me just say this i I play games with the students, but I think I have more fun than they do. Because, <laughs> you know, all the toys I couldn't buy when I was a child. Now I can. Me, me, Brent, <laughs> and I have had this conversation. <laughs> now we can do it in class, you know, and learn another language, which, you know, we take for granted, of course, um, sometimes, because how can't this be easy for you since I already. You know, but I know this language. Why don't you? Know <laughs> yes. Why don't you speak in? Well, but then at the end of the day, uh, if they are learning and they don't think about it as a class, I, mission accomplished. Yeah. yeah, it's so easy for you to say, Jose, but there's so many people out there who will say, "How can you play games in the classroom?" Well, and, um, the the game is just the curtain. Or that show, you know, you you use it as the curtain for it. The objective is very clear, and the students see it. Um, when you're playing a game with the students, the objective needs to be clear, even if the objective is to have fun. Like, what if they ask me sometimes, teacher, why are we doing this? I'll say, because we need a break from life. <laughs> Let's play cards for 10 minutes and period. <laughs> you know, uh, it doesn't need to be this methodological research that goes into a five minute. I know the methodological <laughs> basis for it, but I don't need to inculcate my students with that. I know what I'm doing in class, you know, and if it goes wrong, sorry, do it again next time. Try to make changes and uh, one of the questions people ask is quote unquote how do you keep students under control Mm. while you're playing games because they would think it's a free for all blah 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 and it's like no the objective is clear maybe the first time they do it they may think it's a pastime because you got to take into consideration some students who come from uh, educational backgrounds where the teacher is authority and authoritarian at the same time. But once they realize there is another or many other ways to do the same thing, you know, it, it's a fun ride and they, they enjoy it. Um, you know, uh, let, let me bring something up. We did a fishing activity in class one day. Because I have fishing rods, fishing so they rods. can they have to, yes. So okay. they have to fish for the correct vocabulary or the correct grammar structure, or what I'm asking them. So you can basically write words or 
grammar structures or whatnot in pieces of paper. And you can make your fishing rods out of a pencil, thread, and a hook of any kind. Anything can become a fishing rod, even a pencil, right? So, and I didn't know how many of the students were so into fishing and that <laughs> hit, literally hit home for them. And it was, there was that emotional memory that they connected with. And I was like, oh my God, yesterday I thought this was going to be the most boring activity <laughs> that I've ever done. And here they are, so into it, to fish for vocab words. Okay, so you know? just, just so that people listening can kind of uh, follow along with this. So you have cards, let's just say cards with a vocabulary word on them. And then do you attach, you attach something to the card that the... So you got a fishing, you got a, a a fishing rod, whatever it is, a pencil with a string on it, and then at the end of that string, there's a hook. Is that right? Like a, mm -hmm. like a paper clip right. or something? Yes, and um, and the cards you can cut fish out of paper and punch a hole on it, and anything goes really. Mm. Uh, if you don't, if you don't have a device to make the cards or the fish stand in a position where the students can try to get the hook through it. You can put them on the edges of tables or desks and have the students walk around to fish, you know. You can have students being the fish, too. Uh -oh. They have to, <laughs> yes. <laughs> some of the students have to hold the cards and some will be the fishermen, uh, okay, you know. Okay, okay. Right? So it's a lot of, t in that matter, there is a lot of TPR happening while they're doing this, you know, and they are collaborating. And there is a million variations of the fishing game as well, you know. Uh, the, they can play fish and rescue um, if they have to rescue a classmate who is in a pond or a river or the ocean. They can fish for that classmate who has the correct answer, you know, uh, or... So, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, like, so they're going around, they're fishing. If they catch the wrong one, they catch, they catch one that's the, not the they right get, answer. They go they to, to they, they, we call it they sink. So they have to go to the <laughs> pond or the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> so and then they so, become, and then they become fish. Oh, okay. So this is so, this is so cool because I, I love all of these because they're kind of, um, they're all easy to implement, but they're like, I think for me as a teacher, so much, so many times I think what Michelle was saying too st struck me as like, we're in a rush to get the next thing done, the next thing done. But mm -hmm. most of these are things that like, if you just take a breath, you can implement it. Right? <laughs> like mm -hmm. it doesn't, it's not so much extra work to do these things. And in fact, that breathing time, we know, you know, we know that people need to move. We know that people need to like get a little bit of action and, and just have a variety and all those things. And so just taking the, the, 30 seconds it might take to set that up or to move around the room or to do that in a mm -hmm. different way. I bet, I mean, there'd have to be research on it, but I bet you that time gets gained back in their focus when they're doing the actual work itself too, right? Mm -hmm. It does. It's like a, our, it's like a mental yeah. reset, I, I think. I mean, I, I'm i thinking, oh, I would love to see that happening and then see how later they, they, they'll inevitably, someone will say, oh, remember when you went, you were wrong because of this? And they'll remember because of whatever action, that physical action. Uh -huh. So you're, as you're saying like, oh, you went to the sink. <laughs> uh -huh. I bet someone's going to remember that later. Yeah, they do. And uh, as for timing, I, I am a, I'm a sinner in that area because I'm, I'm terrible with pacing. I'm trying to get better at pacing. Uh, but I noticed that even when I fall behind schedule, the students gained so much more than just, you know, if I had just stuck to flipping pages, one exercise to the other, and no connection, no bridges, nothing. So... Sometimes I will I will sacrifice pacing for doing something that is going to be memorable and they'll connect with, you know. Um, so yeah, 
So the, the fishing activity is a favorite. Many many of our students come from countries where fishing, fishing with their family is a big thing, mm. you know, and um, they they find a connect, they connect to it at a different level. And mind you, uh, some of these activities may sound childish for some people, but con- you have to consider that all of our students are adults. And they get into this <laughs> big times, you know, and even the ones who are a little bit reluctant to dive in and enjoy it, give them three minutes, give them three minutes. And I always tell them, like, you can come here and be happy for six hours or miserable for six hours. It's your choice. I can change mm. by Felicia because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's it's the reality of things. Do you want to sit in class and be miserable for six hours? Or do you want to try a different way of learning the same thing more effectively and have a good time? Yeah, I agree. I think, uh, as I think as, as we move to wrap up, I'm thinking of, um, I have a, a, a set of super Mario, like little Lego figurines that you can stack up and whatever. And I just keep them in my classroom in the corner. It's really a conversation piece. But what happens is during the breaks, my adult students, 30 year olds, 40 year olds, 50 year olds will head over to that corner and they'll make a conversation about it with someone else because they can connect to when they were a child and they played mm-hmm. or they buy that for their kids. And so now you have had you have these students um, talking to each other that would maybe have not talked because I had a conversation piece. And I think that that's just uh, when you include things that tie our students' cultures together or their early childhood memories together, then that, that does give you a chance for for an authentic language exchange which mm-hmm. games do <laughs> yes i have a i in a future episode we can talk about legos um like oh yeah <laughs> one That's set of games. legos oh one you need you need one set of legos to take it to places in in class that the students would be mind blown uh, Just say we're gonna run out of time here, but that's like I'm I'm like oh I really want to, what what's the uh, what's the the one Lego set you would recommend? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I like the 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 generic one. It, I think it's two hundred fifty pieces. Uh, it, it's like ten dollars or less than ten dollars now. You know, and you can do that as a you can use it as a pointing system to a scoring system. Like the more they the more they get the right answer, they can pile up and connect Legos. And the group with the highest tower at the end of the day is the winner of uh, nice. whatever you establish. <laughs> Just say you need to write a manual. You need to write a little quick and dirty. Um, like manual for teachers who are traveling and need low tech ideas on how to. Yeah. And, and mind you, I'm, I'm a big fan of tech. I use tech in class. I also take into consideration that many students are not tech savvy and that will add to their anxiety. Mm. Right. Because um, explaining how an activity is done online or showing it can heighten their level of anxiety and that will get in the way of learning what the objective of the day, what language sample of the day is. So if I can reduce that level of anxiety by doing something low tech, I'll go for it. Then I'll transition, you know, to something high tech, quote unquote, high tech, whatever the standard of high tech is, (laughs) you know? Uh, So yeah. Uh, And anything that I see online also that is high tech, quote unquote, I try to make it a point to have a low tech version of it Mm. that I can easily adapt if I don't have the technology available, if I'm traveling, uh, if the students are not comfortable with technology, whatnot. I love it. So Jose, you've, you've given us tons of 
practical, implementable, uh, quick, quick ideas to, to think. And I, I think the, the best part is like, there's so many different parts to spark us and go, oh, well, hold on a second. I can do this version or this variation mm-hmm. inside of my own classroom as well. So, um, I think we're, we're going to, uh, get you back at some point. We'll do a whole, maybe do a whole Lego episode. I think there, that'd be a lot of fun too. Um, we can <laughs> all come in. up with ideas on <laughs> how to do some Lego stuff, but, um, we, we need to do like a drinks with diesel and, and have our our brainstorming session there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good idea. Count me in. All right, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we're gonna wrap up here and uh, and jump on over. It is time for our fun finds, and this time around, I have kind of an it's old but continues to regenerate. It's the Monster Hunter video game series. Um, oh. Have you heard of? Monster Hunter. Uh-uh. I mean, uh, yeah. the name sounds familiar, but I'm, I'm not sure. So it's just, you know, for those of us who like um, exploring worlds and then hunting like dinosaur crossover dragon beasts and then building armor. Um, I recently, while I was in California, I introduced my, my six-year-old nephew to it. And uh, I feared that my sister would say, no, it's too scary. Oh, my nephew loved it. Okay. And so... Um, they're, they have them on, on like every platform, but I just think it's fun. And yeah, Monster Hunter, the nice. game series, any of them are, are good. Awesome. Um, so mine is <laughs> pretty simple. It's a, a silicon, uh, the silicone egg molds, you know, like if you, it's just a, a silicone ring, right? With a little handle on it. Um, and I bought one of these five, six years ago, something like that. But uh, recently I've started using it again. I kind of found it in the back of the cupboard somewhere. And I'm like, oh, I bought these <laughs> things. It's just, it's just a little, like a three inch circular mold, right? And you uh, make scrambled eggs and you pour it into it and it makes a, um, you know, like a, a, it just heats up an egg in the shape of a circle, but it's like perfect for a bagel topping, you know? And so it, 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 it the reason I like it so much is just because it makes my my dumb bagel and eggs breakfast into like a little fancier breakfast, uh, you know, Fancy. breakfast sandwich, which is nice. Uh, so I just I grill a little uh, bacon and then I throw on the egg ring and the egg circle. And it's like, it's almost like a professional breakfast uh, very quickly uh, with one of these silicone egg molds. And I recommend the one that have the. Uh, the pivoting arm so you can actually kind of reach into the pan and lift it off because there are these, uh, these other ones that don't have that and you'd probably burn your fingers so um <laughs> anyways uh that silicone. just sounds like another thing you have to wash it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking, I'm you thinking. should probably wash anything that you're cooking with at any at any uh, given point yes <laughs> not really <laughs> <laughs> just say what do you have for us um one thing that i would recommend and i think every teacher should spoil themselves with and give it a try is a hand lotion called tokyo milk <laughs> like tokyo the milk. city of tokyo yes. i've heard of tokyo the milk city- mm-hmm Okay. Yes, the city of Tokyo milk because it's very moisturizing, especially if you deal with papers and you are in the AC all day. And <laughs> it's not it's not sticky. It's very good. Tokyo. I was it's recently yeah, I was recently looking at Tokyo milk um, um, perfumes or they have mists. Is there any particular fragrance for the hand lotion that you recommend? Mm, all of them it's there is no you can't you can't go wrong with tokyo milk yes and the lotion and the the mists are equally amazing oh, good to know yes and if you have carpet in your classrooms and you want that smell of mist and mildew to go away <laughs> or the smell of dust just you know, okay. Drip some <laughs> Tokyo milk canned lotion on your carpet and you'll be. <laughs> yeah. And you ask Just people to roll on it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Awesome. Tokyo milk hand lotion. All right. All right. If you are finding this episode useful and you're giving us a shout out, you can do that. Please tag us on any social media. We're 
on all the platforms. I think <laughs> we're we're out there. Um, yeah, share the show. Uh, if you're if you're so inclined, uh, sometimes people ask send messages. Ishala was telling you about this the other day. Some people mm-hmm. say like, "Hey, is it okay if I share this with people?" Yeah, please share. share. It. <laughs> it's all public. Uh, please share if you uh, like the show. Uh, we have a little Patreon over there if you're interested in supporting us. Um, you can get the show notes for this episode at diesel.org slash seven eight. That's the number seventy eight. And of course, you can listen to us at voice said canada that's v-o-i-c-e-d dot c-a uh yeah as you shall mention we are on the socials we're still kind of in the like what's going to happen with the socials thing but we're still on, on twitter for now um uh the show is at diesel pod and i am at brent g warner i'm at xc underscore pixie that's i-x-y underscore p-i-x-y and if you want to ask jose any questions where can they reach you jose uh, they can email me at junior Saudi. Uh, it's spelled J U N I O R. Saudi is S as in Sam, O D as in David, I at hotmail.com. And that's Very it. cool. Awesome. We will have we will have that. So reach out to us. Okay, and then Jose, the last part is just this little language part here. Um, you shall put it up at the top of the chat. Um, so, you know, we've done, you know, the, the basic example we say in um, in Spanish, Spanish, thank you, is gracias. Gracias for tuning, that's not turning, that's tuning into the diesel podcast. Um, and you can choose any language that you want to say for that. All right. Okay. And can say <laughs> yep. yep, ready uh, when you are. Okay. So in Portuguese, thank you is obrigado. Obrigado for tuning in. Oh, do it. <laughs> it's okay. It happens all the it time. Every time. You jinxed it. Yeah, one more time. Okay. <laughs> in Portuguese, thank you is obrigado. Uh, obrigado for t- tuning in uh, in the Dissol podcast. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Obrigado. Merci. <laughs>